Hello and welcome to our WSMI recording this Thursday, the 30th of April at 7pm. I'm Michael Francis, Music Director of the Florida Orchestra. And before I talk about two of the pieces that we have coming up, I want to introduce our star pianist for this concert back in January, Gilles Von Sattel, who performed Beethoven's Third Piano Concerto. Here he is to give his own personal introduction from Manhattan, no less. Hello to everyone listening on WSMR. It's my great pleasure today to be able to revisit with you my performance of the Beethoven Third Piano Concerto with the Florida Orchestra and Maestro Michael Francis. I have really wonderful memories of uh, these collaborations, of these performances of this piece, which happened back in January. Uh, I'm now reaching you in mid-April and in very different times. Um, just now, actually a few minutes after seven o'clock, uh, outside this window in New York City, People were banging pots and singing uh, to honor the healthcare workers here. And uh, with that as a moving inspiration and backdrop, very happy to be able to talk a little bit about the great Beethoven Third Piano Concerto, share a few ideas with you about this piece. So first of all, this piece is in C minor, a very important key for Beethoven. Uh, well, it's the key of this piece. <laughs> talk about establishing a mood quickly. Um, there's no mistaking that power and that drama, but Beethoven was drawn to this mood uh, in C minor for his whole life as a composer. Uh, early on, uh, piano trio um, in C minor. The pathetic solo piano sonata. Very similar to uh, Opus 111. His final piano sonata. The C minor violin sonata. I just played that shares something very much in common with the way our concerto today begins with quiet menace just in the strings of the orchestra what a mood right something is coming um, when the pianist comes in after a long orchestral introduction you get a volcanic version of this music <laughs> This um, uh, kind of relationship between the demonic and the angelic uh, happens all throughout this first movement. Um, in the first movement also, you, you can't miss the incredible cadenza, the solo piano passage at the end, which uh, makes us realize and think about what a great improviser Beethoven must have been. Now, this is a written out cadenza in the score. Beethoven's very specific about what he wants, but it's in the style of an improvisation. And you can imagine how Beethoven could extemporize at the piano and make this kind of thing up. And the pianist nowadays, the role is to kind of play it as if you're making it up on the spot, all right? Sounds like this, the beginning of it. <laughs> second movement we get a huge change of mood and atmosphere uh, the opening theme feels suspended timeless eternal and this is Beethoven at his most spiritual uh, and we can think about just the 
the sense of contemplation, devotion, uh, and just absolute gentleness that comes out of this music and tenderness, um, just infinite. music for these times. And then our last movement begins with a cheeky theme, very humorous, goes back to minor, maybe a bit back to reality, but very mischievous. <laughs> um, pay attention too to this amazing theme in A flat major that shows up in the middle. first to the clarinet for a beautiful, beautiful woodwind color. Um, how Beethoven ends this piece? Well, if we think about the Fifth Symphony, uh, it's very famous for ending with a blast of glory in C major, right, from lightness to dark. Now this piece also ends in major, but it's not really a blast of glory. It's more the way a Mozart opera might end with pure comedy, with joy, with laughter, with something a little bit silly. So there's this great big orchestra tutti uh, section with orchestra that comes to a crashing halt. Then the pianist gets a ludicrous, uh, ludicrously virtuosic cadenza. Gets lost. that's about all I want to say to set this up. Please enjoy the Beethoven Third Piano Concerto with myself, Gilles Von Saddle on piano, the great Florida Orchestra, and the great Michael Francis conducting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gilles, for the memorable performance and the terrific explanation you just gave. So, for the rest of the concert, this was based around a partnership with the Museum of Fine Arts St. Pete, something Kristen Shepard, the executive director there, and myself cooked up which ended up being the biggest collaboration the Florida Orchestra has ever had with the museum, involving multiple concerts, takeovers by the Florida Orchestra, all to celebrate a tremendous exhibition called The Art of the Stage from Picasso to Hockney. And this was the opening of that whole exhibition and our chance to really give our largest concert. So we began the concert with Rimsky Korsakov's The Golden Cockerel, the introduction and the wedding march. And above the screen, effectively, well, on the screen above us, were the um, costumes and stage designs by Natalia Goncharova, a Russian artist. And these are very beautiful, vibrant images which tell the story of the Golden Cockerel. And if you don't know what that is, I shall remind you now. So, Tsar Dodin is a Russian Tsar who's looking for a wife, but also has tremendous ambitions towards the neighbouring state of Shamaka. He has two rather idiotic sons. So the way the story goes is that an astrologer appears with a golden cockerel who agrees to help the Tsar. And the Tsar then sends his sons off into battle, but they're so idiotic they kill each other. 
at which point the Tsar then meets the beautiful Tsarita of Shamaka, and through the help of the golden cockerel, falls in love with her. The story continues and they end up marrying at the very end, the wedding march, everything seems to be great. And the astrologer comes to the Tsar and says, now I've helped you. You said I could have anything I wanted. I would like the hand of the Tsarita in marriage. At which point the Tsar flies into a terrible rage and kills the astrologer. At which point the golden cockerel comes down and plucks out the throat of the Tsar. Now that's the story. Not entirely sure what the moral of it is, but however, it does lead to some incredible music. This was Rimsky-Korsakov's last opera. Rimsky-Korsakov was a Russian composer, and he was the father of Russian nationalism, part of a group called the Mighty Five, with Mussorgsky, Borodin, Balakarivki, and of course himself. And this really changed it, um, the whole of the musical landscape in Russia. This was his last opera, and he, although he didn't actually hear it completed, it does show so many hallmarks of his wonderful style, which is tremendous orchestration, brilliantly atmospheric writing. At the beginning, you will hear this mysterious quality where the astrologer appears to tell the story of what's about to happen, a prologue, if you like. And at the very end, we'll have then the wedding march, which is the music at the end of the opera, which is so vibrant as all the various guests from the exotic lands appear with great military garb and beauty and excitement. And really glorious music to kick off this concert. Our second half, Stravinsky's Polchinella. This is a slightly bittersweet moment because this week we are meant to be performing Stravinsky's Rite of Spring in our most gargantuan concert of the season. Rite of Spring in the first half, followed by Strauss's dark and seedy Dance of the Seven Veils, followed by Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and Mahler's beefed up steroid version of the symphony it would have been an extraordinary concert and a real highlight so we're all very disappointed not to be performing that but also delighted to be reliving this uh, great piece and this great concert. So Stravinsky wrote The Rite of Spring in 1930. He was the enfant terrible of classical music. Outrageous, powerful, dramatic, strong, pagan, dark, revolutionary harmony. This, this piece was so shocking they had a riot at the world premiere in 1913. Well, 1919, just after the First World War, just some six years later, Stravinsky did a complete U-turn on his musical direction. He went from writing his extreme modernist music to suddenly going back to the classical period in the style that became known as neoclassicism. In fact, it should be called neo-baroque because he based it upon the composer Pergolesi. He discovered his music and wanted then to write a ballet with Diaghilev, who, of course, the Ballet Russe Commission, the Rite of Spring, the Firebird, all these incredible ballets from the start of the 20th century. But for Pulcinella, he looked at the story of Pulcinella, which we often known as the Harlequin in Britain, or Petrushka, is how it's known in Russia, and Pierrot in French. This is, of course, the, the masked clown, the buffoon, the, the court jester, uh, which is involved in, in, well, in so many different aspects of culture. And Stravinsky took the music of Pergolesi, a relatively unknown 18th century composer, and kept the bass part and the melody part in position, but then changed all the harmonies. If someone described it as being like that moment when Andy Warhol takes the uh, Mona Lisa and throws acid on it, I think that's a terrific um, image of it, or sort of seeing an 18th century painting, everything looks perfect, except one of the characters has a big neon punk, pink Mohican as well. There's something isn't quite right. There's lots of sort of piquant and dashes of Tabasco in the harmony. An unusual orchestration. There's a solo quartet. It's a small chamber orchestra, um, but there's tremendous moments of virtuosity. Listen to the Tarantella. Tarantella, by the way, is a dance in which it's meant to be as if you were bitten by a tarantula. What kind of sort of uh, fits and things would you go into? And also they say if you are bitten by a tarantula, you've got to dance so much to get it out of your bloodstream. Tarantella. There's also a great moment at the end in which the buffoonery of the solo trombone and solo double bass come to the fore. But amongst this, there's these wonderful moments of beauty and a refinement, uh, but again, always with that little bit of spice. Usually it's only performed in the suite, but we're performing the entire ballet. Why? Well, as I mentioned already, we had this great partnership with the Museum of Fine Arts. And so they have a Picasso stage design, which he designed for the original production of Pulcinella. 
And so we took, uh, took that and we asked our visual artist in residence, Jeff Strick, to then provide a series of scenic backdrops which we projected onto the large screen so you could imagine what it looks like now. Incredible washes of colour. And we also asked the Tampa City Ballet, a new ballet troupe here in Tampa, run by Paula Nunes and Elsa Barbuena, to provide the full ballet for us. It really was an extraordinary visual and oral spectacle, something which was unlike anything we've done before on that scale. Our soloists for this evening, there are three singers, Kevin Diaz is our bass, Joshua Blue is the tenor, and Madison Leonard is our soprano. A vibrant, extraordinary concert, which really captures all that we look to do in Florida, which is, of course, communicate this wonderful music at its very best. And at the very heart of it, as the tremendous playing of the Florida Orchestra. This may not be Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, which you would have heard this weekend, but it is still nonetheless a glorious piece of Technicolor Stravinsky for you this week, alongside a marvellous performance of Beethoven and, of course, the kaleidoscopic images of Rimsky-Korsakov's The Golden Cockle Suite. Thank you very much.